Hello, welcome to the final, final video of the semester. We are on the final week. You have this lesson on European exploration, and then you have your final exam. Your final exam, in case you're curious, all of the questions are taken from these lectures that I have created for you. And it is 46 questions long, 45 of them are multiple choice, and one is a painfully easy short answer that shouldn't give you any problems at all. Just make sure that you completely answer the question. All right, moving on to European exploration. Europe in the 1400s. When we get to the 15th century, it's really important to know that Europe, they don't know anything else about the world than what the ancient Romans did. Like it still took the same amount of time to sail from Turkey to Spain as it did for the ancient Romans. Uh, there was still no regular sea traffic between northern and southern Europe out in the Atlantic. But that's all going to change by the year 1500. There are some reasons for exploration. The very first thing I want to tell you is population is not a factor. Um, when we get to the year 1500, the European population, it still hasn't recovered from the Black Death. And it's not gonna do that for another couple of decades. So if it's not population, what is it? Uh, it's the role of national governments. Explorations are gonna be encouraged by national governments that are wealthy enough to finance it. If the national government doesn't have the power, prestige, and money, they're not gonna send people to go and explore. So, that takes out countries that don't have national governments, like Italy and Germany. That's also going to take out any prolonged exploration by the Vikings. And you're really just going to be left with the Portuguese, the Spanish, the French, and the English, really. And that's it. There's a scarcity of items. Now, Europeans are encouraged to search the world because they're looking for things they can't produce themselves. And that's going to be things like spices and silk, and cotton cloth, precious stones. And pepper is ridiculously expensive. You can go to Aldi or Walmart right now and get pepper. Very, very affordable. But back then, pepper was worth like $12,000 for 100 pounds. Now, why would you need 100 pounds? of pepper. I don't know. What you do in your own time is your own business. But, you know, if you ever wanted to know, in 1500, 100 pounds of pepper, $12,000. Today, you can go to Amazon, you could get 100 pounds of pepper for about $500. The Renaissance is going to play a big part in this because for the first time, people aren't really as bound by the limits of Christianity as they had been before. People are not afraid to ask questions. People are not afraid to go out and explore. And the Renaissance is also going to bring us that love of the ancient. One of the ancient writings that's rediscovered is called Ptolemy's Geography. Ptolemy's Geography, it's rediscovered in 1409. And Ptolemy was an ancient Greek cartographer. And he accepted the idea that the world was round, but he exaggerated the size of the known territories. So the continents seemed larger and closer together than they really were. The problem is that Ptolemy, he underestimated the circumference of the Earth by about 5,000 miles. Because of course, he didn't know about North America or South America or even Australia at the time. And so this 5,000 mile discrepancy is what led Christopher Columbus to try to sail west to get to China because according to Ptolemy's map, that should have been a shortcut. We also have new inventions. Um, exploration is going to be made possible by new inventions like the sand glass or hourglass. That's the basic timepiece of the period. It's good enough to measure the difference in time in four hour watches on a ship, but you can't calculate longitude. Um, being able to calculate longitude accurately doesn't happen until the 1700s. But if you can figure out what your latitude is, that 
you can figure out where you are. And to measure latitude, you just have to know the distance of the sun from the horizon. Sail so many days and then report it again. So we've got the sand glass. We also have the magnetic compass that's first developed around 1300. And that helps people determine their position at sea. And when you add in something called the astrolabe, that lets you actually plot your lines of latitude to keep track of where you're going. We also have improved maps and a new type of ship called the caravan. It's the traditional three-masted ship you probably think of when it comes to exploring. And it's smaller than the old Roman galley, but it could hold more cargo because it was taller. And instead of needing hundreds of people to row the oars, you could power a caravel by 12 men or less. So we have these new inventions that are going to make it a lot easier to sail. Now the Portuguese are going to take the lead in exploring. And they're going to feel their way along Africa. They're going to prove that the Atlantic and the Indian Ocean are connected somehow. And all of this is going to be done under the influence of Prince Henry, the navigator, who uh, Prince Henry lived from 1394 to 1460. Now, Portuguese ships are going to find the Gold Coast of Africa, and by 1500, Portugal controls the flow of gold into Europe and the flow of gold out of Africa. And that really marks the Golden Age of Portugal. At one time, Portugal, which most people can't find on a map today, was the most powerful country in the world. 1487, a guy named Bartholomew Diaz is going to round the Cape of Good Hope at the southern tip of Africa. And Bartholomew Diaz is going to show, hey, the, the Atlantic Ocean and the Indian Ocean are definitely connected. The Portuguese, they have to worry about their arch rival, who is Spain. And there's a treaty called the Treaty of Torcedilla that's signed in 1494 that basically divides up the world between Spain and Portugal. Spain's going to get North America and Central America, while Portugal is going to get control over Africa and Brazil. Now we have Vasco da Gama. In 1497, he set sail and he's eventually going to reach India. Basically, he finds a, a pilot or a navigator, if you will, who promises him that they can get there. And Vasco da Gama is going to make the trip to India, about 2,300 miles across the Indian Ocean in, a, in 27 days. The pilot proves, yes, he's been there, knows how to get there. Uh, once Vasco da Gama gets to India, he does the trade, and then a fight breaks out. His navigator is killed, and it takes three months to go back to Africa. By the time he gets all the way back to Portugal, he's lost two ships and only 59 of the original 170 men make it home. Now, even paying for the cost of the trip, paying for all the lost materials, lost ships, paying off the families of the people who died, he still makes a 600% profit. Huge. In the end, Portugal is going to set up trading posts all the way around Africa and in India and even in parts of China. And wherever these Portuguese traders go, Christianity spreads as well. So we have Christianity in China by 1516, and we have Christianity in Japan by 1549. Spanish exploration is the one you probably think about, and when you think of Spanish exploration, Christopher Columbus is the guy that you look at. Now this is interesting because because Christopher Columbus, first of all, he's not Spanish. He's actually from northern Italy, a place called Genoa. And he's an Italian guy who basically answers a wanted ad. He goes and interviews for the job with Queen Isabella and King Ferdinand of Spain and they hire him. 
and they fund his trip to China. And he says, I can get to China by sailing west. Well, in August of 1492, he leaves Spain, and in October of 1492, he finds land, and he thinks he is off the coast of China, but in reality, he is in what would be today the Bahamas. Now, Christopher Columbus, he's ironically not the first to discover the New World, but he's one of the last. Earlier European explorers to the New World include the Vikings under Eric the Red, who found Greenland. And around the year 1000, when his son Leif Erikson finds Canada, uh, there's even an Irish group led by a monk named Brendan, who sailed across the Atlantic Ocean in a boat made from leather. Now, Christopher Columbus is ultimately going to locate and map out all the major islands in the Caribbean. Uh, he's going to exploit the natives, and he is going to find new souls to win over for Catholicism. And most of the time, that is not by the choice of the local people. Now, Columbus is going to bring with him disease, and the population of Hispaniola, which today makes up Haiti and the Dominican Republic, fell from over 1 million residents in 1493 to under 100,000 by 1510. Christopher Columbus also made more than one trip to America, and in one of his trips to America, he was actually arrested for exploiting the, the local people and he was sent back to Spain in prison. We have Ferdinand Magellan who sails from 1519 all the way until 1521. Ferdinand Magellan is ordered or paid by Queen Isabella and King Ferdinand to find a sea route to the Pacific Ocean. So he sails through the Atlantic to the coast of South America. He follows South America to the southern tip. And then he sails around the bottom tip of South America to an ocean that he finds is very calm. And he names this new ocean the Pacific. Now, Magellan, he thinks that the Ptolemy's map, the Ptolemy's geography is correct. So he continues going, thinking, you know what, China has to just be a little bit down the road, but potentially because of really, really bad luck, he's going to miss every island group in the Pacific. He misses Tahiti, he misses the Marquetas, he misses the, the Fiji Islands, the Samoan Islands, the Philippines is where he finally lands. And it is in the Philippines that Magellan is killed. And the rest of his expedition will finally return to Spain in the year 1521. And it is this return to Spain by his crew after Magellan has died that proves the world is round for sure. There's a group called the Conquistadors. Hernan Cortes in 1519 will capture the Aztec Empire. Pizarro in 1531 will encounter the Inca Empire, and by 1536 he has destroyed the Inca. Then we have Ponce de Leon, who is going throughout the southern United States, landing in St. Augustine, Florida, traveling through southern Georgia, southern Alabama and southern Mississippi. And what's he looking for? The Fountain of Youth. Now let me say, Hernan Cortez, according to legend, meets with the world famous Aztec leader named Montezuma. Montezuma welcomes Cortez back as a god and Cortez says, thanks, it's good to be back. We're friends now. 
and Cortez is able to defeat the Aztecs so quickly because the Aztecs weren't very well liked by their uh, neighbors. And the neighbors say, hey, let's go beat up the Aztecs and Cortez helps. <clears throat> Pizarro, on the other hand, he finds the Inca in the middle of a civil war. And when Pizarro finds the Inca in the civil war, it's between two brothers, he agrees to help one brother beat up the next one. And in the end, Pizarro is going to take over everything. So what were these consequences of exploration? Well, number one, there's new invention. And the one invention I really want to focus on is the Portuguese building the caravel. And there's a picture of a caravel right there. Uh, this is a three-masted ship. It could be sailed using wind power by fewer than 12 men. And this efficient use of manpower was highly important because of the population loss that happened after the Black Death. Huge amounts of gold and silver are going to make their way into Europe, and that's important because of the inflation it brings. In less than 150 years' time, more than 16 million kilograms and more than 175,000 kilograms of gold are brought into Europe, and that is somewhere real close to $19 million worth of gold and silver. So you have all this gold and all the silver being thrown into the European markets currencies become worthless because there's gold and silver everywhere, which meant that prices skyrocket and, and payment weight, wages or salaries, whatever you want to call them, they, they drop because the money's useless. We have the expansion of the slave trade. Now it's really important to know that the slave trade did exist in Africa already and there was a slave trade between African groups and Arab groups going east but this is the first time that Europeans are going to get involved in this. Now African slavery was a regular system but it's very different from the slavery system that emerged in the Americas. In African areas that was mostly kings of these larger African groups or African countries <clears throat> Slavery existed as a form of punishment, uh, prisoners of war, unpaid debts, and slavery was for a limited period of time, and there were legal protections for those who were in slavery. But then you have the Europeans getting involved in this, and it becomes perpetual slavery and continual slavery. Now, the chief market for slaves was South America, specifically the Spanish colonies and Brazil. And Brazil will ultimately take over 40% of all slaves. 4.5, actually, I think it's 5 million slaves plus go to Brazil alone. This is going to shift the demographics of the African continent. Famine, warfare, gender imbalance, all of that is going to be a result of this slavery movement. And almost as soon as the slave trade gets started, there are abolitionist movements that take place as well. Some considered it inhumane, others saw the system as an economic necessity, but no matter which side you fall on, that struggle will start almost as soon as the European slave trade does. One of the most important things of this European exploration is going to be this Columbian exchange. And the Columbian exchange, it's a transfer of biological materials between Europe and the Americas. Sometimes this transfer was intentional, sometimes it's unintentional. And there are four main things that are going to be traded. There's food, there's drinks, there's sickness, and there's ways or methods of cooking. Let's start with food. Uh, food perhaps is the most important import from the New World. 
For example, you have the potato. The potato is originally from South America, and it could grow where it was thought nothing else could, and it eventually spread to both England and Germany. And that's because there are wet soils and short growing seasons in both those places. By the 1800s, the potato becomes the most important crop in all of Europe. Uh, ironically, though, uh, for Northern Europeans, they remain suspicious of the potato because the potato was not mentioned in the Bible and the potato was blamed on causing diseases like leprosy. There are new types of fish that are found off the coast of Newfoundland, at, like salmon and, and things like that. They're brought back to Europe for, for eating. We have the tomato. The tomato can be found in one form or another in every kindergarten or elementary school lunchroom. Uh, the potato it is important, but the tomato, it just changes something because you've got the tomato being very involved in Italian food, which gives us pizza and spaghetti and everything like that. And the tomato was originally known as a pomodoro or golden apple because there was nothing like it in Europe. Now the potato, the fish, the corn, the corn's the most important out of all of these here. The potato's important, tomato's important, fish is important, but it's corn that is by far the most important. And that's because of the amount of food you could get from a, a corn cob. For every five wheat grains that you pick, you had to plant one. But for corn, for every 70 kernels of corn you get back, you only had to point to plant one. That means that a corn cob is much, much more efficient to feed people. You only need to plant one corn kernel to get back more than 70 kernels. That's much better than a five to one ratio. Then you have the sugar trade. Uh, sugar was especially prized for its high profits, and it's going to be the main crop grown in Brazil, Cuba, and Hispaniola. And sugar from the New World, it becomes available just as the supply of honey starts to dwindle. And so sugar becomes the, the main crop in many of the New World places. And of course, the more sugar that's grown, the more slaves are brought over to the New World. We have drinks. Chocolate, I know you don't probably think of that as being a drink today, but that's what it really was to begin with. It was a medicinal drink from Central America. We have coffee. Coffee was originally from the Middle East, but it was found that it grew very well in South America. And coffee, as well as tea, are brought from Asia into South America. Now some coffee houses are going to grow into the largest businesses in Europe. Lloyd's of London is a huge store today. The London stock market started out in a coffee shop. Uh, tea becomes the acceptable alternative to coffee for women. And the tea trade is going to explode in places like China and India, and in many ways, the money from tea sales is what brings growth to the British Empire. And we have disease. Um, we have to talk about disease. Um, some of the most common diseases we think about, smallpox, influenza, cowpox, measles, mumps, rubella, pneumonia, those were, those were illnesses brought from Europe into North and South America. These are just deadly because there is absolutely no immunity to these diseases. In some areas, the native populations suffer a 90% or higher mortality rate within the first 10 years of European visiting. Most historians of early America, they estimate that the total native population of the Americas dropped from about 30 million 
to less than 5 million by 1650. And last but not least, we have cooking style. Uh, barbecue is big in the South, but it was originally a technique used by the Carib native or Carib ethnic group of the Caribbean islands, where they would take meat and they would put it into these green leaves, and then they would put these green leaves over water, and then smoke would, would be created. And it would steam slash smoke the, the meat. And today, what was originally known as bukan or bukan is now known as barbacoa or barbecue. We also have fried chicken. Fried chicken was a traditional way of preparing chicken in African culture. And then when African slaves come to the New World, they bring this cooking technique with them. And today, fried chicken is found across the country. All right, nice, short, and sweet, less than 30 minutes. And um, I encourage you to go back through and watch these videos and look at these PowerPoints before you do your final exam. Because like I said, all the final exam questions come from these, these um lectures and don't go back any further than it, than each drone. The very first question is about what happens after Julius Caesar is murdered. So the very first question has something to do with Julius Caesar and his son Octavian slash Augustus. 45 multiple choice, one short answer. You have one hour to do it in. And because it is timed, I highly recommend don't wait to the last minute. It has been a pleasure. I wish I could have seen some of you in person, but I thank you for taking my class. And if you do need to take US history class, I, I encourage you to consider with me either in person or online. Any questions, just feel free to email me and uh, we'll see you around. Uh, final word, if you are doing one of the extra credit museum reviews, make sure you send that to me by August 2nd. That is the Monday that the final exam is due. So just email your extra credit if you do it to me by August 2nd. All right, until next time, it's been a pleasure. Bye-bye.